heart of where innovation, money, and power collide in Silicon Valley and beyond. This is Bloomberg Technology with Caroline Hyde and Ed Ludlow. at Bloomberg's World Headquarters in New York. And I'm Ed Ludlow in San Francisco. This is Bloomberg Technology. Coming up, we'll talk the state of the digital consumer as inflation shows some signs of moderation with the founder, of course, joining us, CEO of Micmac, a global e-commerce analytics platform. Plus, we'll sit down for an exclusive conversation with the CEO of Databricks, one of the fastest growing software companies, to discuss how they're utilizing AI to power their business. And sticking with AI, we break down the earnings from Oracle as the AI frenzy spurs cloud demand. Plus, we look at how Salesforce is also focusing in on artificial intelligence. But first, let's focus in on these markets because we have some cooling, some signs of cooling in inflation. If you look at not the core CPI, but look at the main overall print, we're back at 4%, lowest we've had since like March 2021. So we are seeing some optimism. The Fed will hold and stand steady for the month of June. We're seeing Nasdaq up about five tenths percent benefit fitting from that risk on feel. But look, this inflationary pressure is being felt elsewhere. We think about the UK at the moment. Yields absolutely spiking. And I want to show what asset is still trading there. The pound versus the US dollar, higher versus US dollar, as we think the Fed might pause. But all eyes on maybe even a 6% level when you're thinking of central bank policy over at the Bank of England. Interesting, of course, moves coming from China. They're going the opposite direction. Instead of curtailing inflation, they're looking to speed up their economy. They're cutting rates that were surprised overnight. That really buoyed some of the commodities markets. We're seeing up more than 3% in oil. But moving on to one of our favorite well, risk assets in the world of technology. Let's look at what's happening in the world of crypto. Look, not dramatic moves, but still pressure remaining on Bitcoin. We're at 25,777 right now. This is even with a weaker dollar ed. So clearly some of this regulatory anxiety is still pressuring the main crypto asset ed. Yeah, when it comes to individual movers, that, that CPI print and the, the idea around the Fed is having some impact here, but there's one name I'm looking at, which is Tesla, up for a 13th consecutive session, longest streak of gains on record, trading at a September high. One of the kind of news events of the last 24 hours was all those charging names coming out all at once, basically, yesterday afternoon, saying, yep, you know what, we're going to adopt the NCACS standard, kind of pivoting to pressure and momentum in that space. A few stories that we're going to cover throughout the show playing out in equity markets when it comes to movers as well. You mentioned Oracle and Salesforce. Oracle moving to the upside, 1.3%. AI is driving cloud momentum. We'll get deep into those numbers with BI analyst Anurag Rana. But interesting AI story with Salesforce as well. It's moving to the downside, 1.5%. They had this event where they kind of explained in real terms how their work in AI is going to better their existing suite of products. Remember, there was also a referendum, essentially, on Mark Benioff's popularity with investors, which we can talk about. We're about to go to Miami, uh, to Florida and talk about Trump. So I just note this stock, Rumble, the conservative um, or right-leaning social platform, down 4.5% with the president in focus uh, and what's happening in court. Yeah, former President Donald Trump is in focus. Let's go straight there. Just for an up update really on what's happening, we're expecting the appearance in a Miami court today after being indicted on 37 counts of allegedly mishandling classified documents. That's, of course, after leaving the White House. Bloomberg's Kayleigh Lyons is outside the courthouse. And when are we anticipating an arrival, Kayleigh? Well, 3 p.m. Eastern time is when he is due to report here at the federal courthouse. We may not actually see him arrive, though. It's expected that he will enter the courthouse via the underground garage. But once inside, he will be arrested and processed, just like anyone else who has been indicted uh, on federal criminal charges. It's potential uh, that he could have his fingerprint and mugshot taken. He may even need to surrender his passport. Then he will go up to the 13th floor of this building behind me, appear before a judge, and is expected to plead not guilty. Of course, this, this indictment came down. Uh, last week, the president has maintained that he is innocent, uh, said that this is a witch hunt, election interference at the highest level. And that is likely the kind of messaging he is likely to take with him from Miami back up to Bedminster, New Jersey this evening. Well, he will be speaking at his golf club at 8.15 p.m. Eastern time, addressing his supporters, supporters and holding a donor event. His campaign expects that he could raise $2 million at that event tonight, which is taking place just hours after he will become the first former president in history ever to be arraigned on federal criminal charges. Uh, Kaylee, local police, one of uh, which has just walked past you in that shot, and authorities 
preparing uh, for some demonstration, right? What's the scene like on the ground right now where you are? Well, the police chief ahead of today has said from 5,000 up to as many as 50,000 demonstrators could be here today. And as a result, there is a pretty heavy security presence. There is a lot of police. There are perimeters set up uh, all around. And there have been, I would say, several dozen uh, both pro-Trump and anti-Trump uh, demonstrators here today. There is a lot uh, of Trump flags, people wearing Make America Great Again gear, uh, a couple that have T-shirts on that indicate Trump is not guilty, that Trump won the election. But there are some anti-Trump people as well holding up signs like lock him up. So far, though, it does does seem peaceful. President Trump, of course, had called for his supporters to show up and peacefully protest. It doesn't seem like there is too much disruptive activity that is taking place here today at this point. All right, Bloomberg's Kaylee Lyons will be bringing us the latest throughout the day from Miami, Florida, but just gave us the latest here on Bloomberg Technology. Thank you so much. Now, elsewhere in the world of eco, headline CPI numbers, inflation easing to the lowest levels since March of 2021. Let's get to the view from the founder of Micmac, a global e-commerce enablement and an analytics platform for multi-channel brands. Joining us now, Rachel Tippograph, who is the Micmac founder and CEO. At, at the street level or the online level, what does that inflation print tell you about the direction of travel right now, Rachel? Yeah, and you know, with the results just coming out, it's really interesting to think about why we're saying inflation might be going down. If we look at food and consumer good categories like appliances, those have been relatively flat. But when we remove that from the equation, inflation is, is still going up. And the reason why we're seeing categories like food and appliances stay relatively flat is that for the last few quarters, brand manufacturers have been raising prices. And the reason why they've been raising prices is that it's more expensive than ever before to bring consumer goods to market, to keep them on the shelf and to market them to consumers. Mm. To offset those margins, they've been raising prices, which is why at Micmac we feel core inflation is more indicative of what's happening in the general economy. And when we look at that inflation continuing to go up yeah. against e-commerce conversion rates, what we're seeing at Micmac is that year over year, e-commerce conversion rates have been declining since 2020. And to put it into context, in 2021, the average e-com conversion rate we saw at Micmac was 7.4%. We're now halfway through 2023, and the average e-com conversion rate is at 4.8%. So it's showing that consumers are more trepidatious to buying right now. Yeah. What does that mean in terms of companies trepidation about marketing. An interesting headline just crossed the Bloomberg. Netflix is going to open a pop-up restaurant, apparently, called Netflix Bites in LA. I mean, of course, that's a marketing focus. It's itself a company that's taking in advertising, in fact, dollars from other companies now. How willing and able are companies to experiment in this environment if the conversion rates are pretty low? Yeah, I think for most big brands and brands that understand what it takes to test, stand the test of time, you have to advertise during trying economic times. Look in Procter & Gamble. They've proven that over 100 years. That being said, every dollar is being scrutinized right now by folks that hold the title, like CFO, and they're holding the marketing teams accountable to driving business results, which has created a perfect tailwind for the rise of retail media, meaning Meta's biggest competitor isn't just Snap or TikTok, it's also Amazon, Target, Walmart. Hmm. And what the retailers have at their advantage is consumer purchase data and their ability to monetize that data and say, hey, we know who needs to replenish diapers right now. So if you have $1 to spend to market diapers, you should give it to us over a platform that may not know that. So from a marketing standpoint, we're continuing to see brands spend, but they're spending in more strategic channels that have more visibility into the end sales data so they can understand marketing effectiveness. Rachel, we're showing on the screen, you know, the difference in direction of travel between goods and services inflation. And you learn in a recessionary and an inflationary environment that it, who is leading who? You know, that there's a response to the consumer and their change in behavior. But there's also the reaction from the retailers themselves. Based on what you see in the market, who moves more quickly? you know, the consumer to change habits or the online retailer to respond to them? 
Yeah, it's it's a give and a take for your point. Um, but right now, what we're seeing in, to, in terms of how consumers are spending is they're really spending on essentials. At Micmac, we have over 3,000 retailers in the network, and we collect basket-level sales data. And so we can tell you right now what America's buying, bottled water, granola bars, teeth whitening kits, press-on nails, and weed killers. And what that shows you is, hey, these are essential items, but when it comes to things like beauty, for example, you could go to the salon to get your nails done, or you could buy on press on nails at Walmart. And so in some of these discretionary categories, we are seeing consumers be more choosy with the things that they're willing to do on their own versus go to a more service oriented place. Oh boy, if so, I get served one more press on nail kit, Instagram <laughs> marketing, I'm gonna explode. So clearly that's the place it is right now. Don't blame us. <laughs> you got them on, Rachel Tiffograph. Thank you so much for spending some time with us. Pink Mac founder and CEO, really interesting there. Weed killer, sexy stuff. Meanwhile, coming up, look, we're going to be sitting down for an exclusive conversation with the CEO of Databricks as they acquire Rubicon. It's a stealth infrastructure startup. It's focusing on storage systems. That's key for AI, says the CEO. Meanwhile, watching shares of Apple, the company's stock is being downgraded to neutral from buy by UBS, which the analyst is citing softer demand outlook for the iPhone and in particular for services growth as well. And it's notable that this downgrade is pushing bullish analysts' ratings on the stock to a two-year low, off by three-tenths of percent. Remember, it was a record high yesterday, this is Bloomberg. Databricks is announcing it's acquired Rubicon, a stealth infrastructure startup focusing on storage systems for AI. Databricks is used by more than 9,000 organizations worldwide who rely on the company's Lakehouse platform to unify their data analytics and AI. The startup also hit key milestones for revenue and top line growth. Joining us now, Databricks CEO Ali Godzi. A lot to go over. I'm learning a lot about Databricks this morning. Let's start with, with the top line. You've just closed out a financial year at the end of Jan, hit a billion dollars of revenue, which is a milestone. But the growth's really interesting. That makes you one of the fastest growing software names out there. What's driving it? Yeah, it's really tailwinds. By the way, it's the fastest growing software, if I, you know, to our, according to our records. But what is driving it is really we're seeing tailwinds, one, around AI. Everyone wants AI now. And we've been saying it for 10 years that data and AI is going to be the future that in every industry, the winners are going to be data and AI companies. But something happened in November last year, and everyone kind of realized after ChatGPT that this is the future. And the second thing is TCO reduction. People want to cut down their costs of data spend, and our Lakehouse platform helps that. Uh, data warehousing, SQL, is the product. You're also sharing some financials on that particular product. I remember when you announced it. You know, it's a domain you compete with Snowflake in. What's driving this growth? Is this a market share gain for you? Yeah, so we've announced that we now passed 100 million ARR on our data warehousing product that we just frankly launched just a year ago. Uh, so what's going on here is that this Lakehouse paradigm helps organizations cut down their cost of data warehousing significantly. And, you know, there's a tale of two cities. On the one hand side, everybody wants AI and they want to spend on AI. On the other hand, everyone wants to reduce their cost and they want to reduce the spend on data warehousing. So it's really that cost TCO optimization that's driving that tailwind behind data warehousing spend. Caroline, from organic growth to inorganic growth, yeah. Ali Godzi and Databricks have been out shopping. Yeah, I'm interested in that deal, Rubicon. This is all about storage systems. You say it's the backbone of AI. Ali, did you have to pay up? I mean, this isn't a cheap time to be trying to buy a company related to AI right now. Yeah, right now you have to pay up. That's just as simple as it is. And everyone that's doing anything with AI, and this was a team that can build storage for all kinds of unstructured data. This is the oil that fuels AI. Uh, you know, those are not cheap right now. And this is the team uh, that actually has built it previously at Dropbox and before that at Google. So this is a team that really knows how to build this kind of sort of data systems for AI, uh, you know, Sergey uh, and team are really, really experienced, so we're excited to have them as part of Databricks. 
Of course, you, as you said, for the last decade have been telling people the future is data, it's AI, your own, well, experience, two decades in this particular field, and in particular with deep roots, not only in AI research, Ali, but also in open source software. And I'm interested in your take on just sort of theoretically at the moment, as everyone Warren debates as to whether OpenAI, Microsoft, Google are going to eat the entire lunch when it comes to large language models, when it comes to application, or whether open source is actually already showing that there aren't any modes. Where do you stand on this divide? Yeah, I would say two things. I would say, on the one hand, we absolutely want uh, open source uh, to flourish because as AI becomes more and more powerful, we want the researchers around the world to understand this technology. We don't want just one or two companies to sit on top of this, and they're the only ones that know if it's going wrong or right. We want researchers, the whole world, to understand the models, what can go around, well, you know, how do we align them with us, that's one. Uh, the second thing is, I actually think it's impossible for one or two companies to keep up with the competition. Uh, every university on the planet, every researcher now in the data field, in the tech field, is focused on LLMs, generative AI. I've never seen anything like it before. So it's going to be very hard for one company to keep a proprietary model that they say is ahead of everybody else, and it's ahead of open source. So, and we've seen this. Every day we're having new results in open source. You know, I follow it very closely. It's no longer months. It's no longer weeks. It's every day, multiple times a day, there's a new breakthrough result. So I think it's going to be very hard for proprietary closed companies to stay ahead. What is the Ali Godzi view on when and why Databricks would go public? And I just want to caveat that, you know, there's reports that you kind of trim the valuation on the company. Didn't slash, but trimmed. But what would push you to do that? Yeah, so look, uh, I've always said it. IPO is something we will do in the future. For us, we think that we're going to be a really successful, sustainable business in the long run in the you know, next decade or so. So this is just a milestone. Right now the markets are shut down. We're not over-optimizing for this IPO event. Uh, we'll get there you know, whenever the time is right. Uh, there's just so much demand for our business right now. And frankly, we want to be able to invest in AI. We want to be able to do the investments that uh, we're allowed to do as private companies. It would be actually hard to do that as a public company. So actually right now it's really helping us to stay for private. Databricks CEO, Ali Godsey there. We thank you for bringing us the update on some of the revenue numbers and the acquisition. Stay well. Meanwhile, coming up, let's talk about the chip designer arm. Well, it is looking at IPOing, perhaps rather sooner than Databricks, and it's looking for investors as well to fund that IPO. Intel, interestingly, could be one of them to be a key investor, more on the UK-based company and its building momentum after the break. Plus, just let's take a quick look, not only at Intel stock, but Oracle shares as well. The company is saying, look, their cloud computing business is just rapidly rising in terms of its growth, particularly in the coming fiscal year as well. This is helping send shares have been a new record high. We're up one and a half percent today. Remember, they were up six percent ahead of their numbers yesterday. This is Bloomberg. Time now for Talking Tech. Kathy Wood is making new bets on other tech stocks after, of course, dropping NVIDIA from her funds largely. Two ARK Invest funds purchased roughly 175,000 shares of Meta, while the ARK Autonomous Technology and Robotic ETF, it picked up more than 98,000 shares of the chipmaker TSMC. Meanwhile, TSMC also regaining its $500 billion market cap as investors buy into artificial intelligence and look sift through which stocks are best placed to thrive during this AI boom. While TSMC touted its potential role within AI, has expressed some caution over the outlook for the smartphone market in particular. That, of course, comprises a significant chunk of its revenue so far. And let's look at ARM. It's a SoftBank-backed chip designer. It's in talks with potential investors, including Intel, to be an anchor in its New York listing later this year. Sources are saying that the company has held talks with other firms about funding the IPO. Arm is expected to be one of the most significant IPOs of the year, Ed. Yeah, let's chip away Ooh. at this story further. <laughs> oh. Bloomberg Deals reporter Katie Roof joining us from Los Angeles. An anchor investor, you and I have been across many IPOs in years. An anchor investor gives you a bit of confidence. A peer in your industry, that's very interesting. 
Yeah, exactly. And investors like this SoftBank stock traded up on the news. Um, yes, a lot of times you'll see an anchor investor of about 100 to 200 million in size to help shore up confidence. Um, you know, it's a vote of confidence, uh, a bet, you know, from a competitor and also a partner um, that shows that uh, they're, they're serious and excited about arms technology. I mean, they have a relationship already, a technical one, the fact that it would become a financial one. I mean, remind us of in the past when this has happened, because sort of Qualcomm has underpinned previous listings as well. Yeah, yeah, it's happened with Qualcomm and then Mobileye. There have been other anchor investors in the past. Um, Mobileye was spun out from Intel last year. Um, and so not just in this category, but in general, it's something that you sometimes see with IPOs ahead of the roadshow, ahead of drumming up interest from institutional investors to have this strategic anchor investor to shore up confidence. So Katie, you are the name on, uh, on the deals newsletter publishing this morning, a big focus on all the talk out in L.A. and L.A. Tech Week. And Cara and I, you know, we look at each of these tech weeks, L.A., New York, San Francisco. Sometimes a lot comes out of it and sometimes very little does. What did you learn on the ground? Well, I had fun. <laughs> what, what did I learn? Um, I, I chatted with uh, Mantis, the, the chain smokers, the band. Uh, they have a venture fund um, and they, they threw events uh, with uh, DJed by Travis Barker. I mean, it wouldn't be LA Tech Week without participation from Hollywood. Um, I spoke to Will I Am, um, who my editor ah. joke should be called Will AI Am, because he's been inter interested in AI for uh, really the past decade. He's had multiple AI startups. He has a new one. Um, and he spoke to me about, you know, why he's excited about AI, but also how he thinks that, um, you know, it could provide an opportunity for there to be a reset uh, for, for new yeah. jobs. And, um, you know, he's going back to his home community to help um, you know, prepare them for the, the changing job market. Um, <laughs> yeah. There were, you know, a lot of different events, uh, sometimes at uh, Hollywood mansions and, um, you know, sometimes right. featuring pizza robots. But, you know, it was exciting to catch up with LA's tech industry. I'm not sure there's any tech reporter that hasn't spoken to Will I Am now. I think you've, Ed, you, he's turned up at Mercedes events for you. I think I interviewed him right. at Mobile World Congress or Viva Tech or something. Meanwhile, these events are going thick and fast. I think it's London Tech Week on at the moment. So maybe he's over there right now. Katie Roof, we thank you so much for telling us about all the LA parties that she's been at, as well as all the deals that are being done there. Go check out her MNA deals discussion is in the latest newsletter on the Bloomberg Terminal. Meanwhile, coming up, Oracle surging to a record high on the promise of continued cloud growth in the coming fiscal year. How clouds the key business? This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to Bloomberg Technology. I'm Caroline Hyde in New York. And I'm Ed Ludlow in San Francisco. Let's get a check in on the market. Stocks pushing higher, including the technology sector, driven by the inflation print that we got. The idea being that the chances of a hike in 24 hours time at the Fed meeting increasingly lower. That's not to say the market thinks that the Fed is done, but we are now a little more certain about a June meeting pause or however you want to phrase it. SP 500 up 7 tenths of 1%. The tech heavy NASDAQ 100 Slightly underperforming that, but basically in line. That's as yields push higher. The U.S. 10-year, 3.78% up by about five basis points. And we talked about our fi sort of favorite risk asset, but Bitcoin actually did start to move a little lower, down just three-tenths of a percent in the session to 25,809 U.S. dollars per token. Two kind of mover stories out there this Tuesday morning. Oracle and Salesforce. Oracle, an earnings story where cloud momentum being driven by compute demand for AI, also kind of granularity coming from Larry Ellison, the chairman, about $2 billion of bookings fueled by LLM compute demand. And then Salesforce demonstrating its competence, Caro, in the field of generative AI, how the work they're doing there is going to boost their existing offerings in the world of CRM and other software suite and tools. But, of course, we also had this kind of soft referendum on Mark Benioff's popularity, which he did better on 
this year than last. And it's worth reminding ourselves just how far both of these stocks have rallied this year. I think Oracle's up more than 50%, Salesforce giving away a little bit today, but up more than 60% on the year. Let's dive deeper into just what's behind the share price momentum. And of course, it's cloud momentum mainly across both. Anurag Rana is with us, Bloomberg Intelligence Senior Tech Analyst. And let's start on Oracle because a lot of notes coming out that they loved, in particular, Oracle's cloud infrastructure that they seem to be seeing. A key highlight for you as well as for Jeffries. Yeah, this is, I mean, it was the acceleration in uh, infrastructure as a service was a bit uh, surprising to us. It was quite a bit shocker only because, uh, you know, the whole world is slowing down right now in terms of consumption. And here is Oracle, uh, even though it's a smaller base, you know, but improving their growth rates. Now, this is where we, you know, wrote this morning that this is going to do, you know, get some work done from both Amazon and Microsoft in terms of explaining to the market that they're not losing market share and everybody is going to benefit from both the AI boom and people moving more workloads to the cloud. Now, remember, Oracle's very good at marketing itself, and uh, I think they did a phenomenal job over the last few quarters, and, and we can see the uh, results of that. Uh, speaking of marketing oneself, hmm. Salesforce set out its stall in terms of what it's doing in the field of generative AI. Where does Salesforce sit in the AI wars from the BI perspective, Anurag? So one of the things that we have talked a lot about is when, it, when you look at generative AI, consumer applications are going to be the first one to embrace this. And we have seen that already with ChatGPT and you know, Bing, including some of that stuff. You're going to get more of that in the coming uh, months. A large portion of that is because the data, the consumer data, is a little bit easier to get than enterprise data. When you look at a company like Salesforce, the number one concern for corporations right now is, are they going to use my data to come up with some new algorithm and then you know, start um, divulging those data sources out there? And I think what Salesforce did yesterday was very smart. They had to explain to people that your personal data will remain private as a company. Um, we're not going to use it. If you're going to use it, it's only going to be for you. So I think it's a first good step in explaining to people what it means. Um, I think Salesforce is a big beneficiary in the long run because it, both their cloud products, whether it's sales cloud or customer relationship management or the, um, the customer service cloud, both are three times bigger than the nearest rival in the cloud. And I think they are sitting on top of a lot of data and they're gonna benefit from that. All right, well, thanks to Anurag Rana of Bloomberg Intelligence reacting to what's been a busy 24 hours in news flow. Let's get more perspective on AI and cloud software from Manny Medina, CEO at Outreach. Outreach is a Salesforce partner and an AI-driven sales platform which is used by thousands of enterprises to increase sales rep productivity. And it's a great place to start because the question Caroline and I constantly pose, Manny, is how does the introduction of generative AI tools not just change sales function, but does it eliminate some as well? Uh, let, let's take a step back. So the, uh, the, we're at the very early innings of what Gen AI and, and AI, AI in general can do for a, for a sales rep and for a sales manager. And the winners of this race are going to be called out in the next two years, if you would. But what's important is that if, if you go to the future, and you imagine, you know, what, what is the non-negotiable? So if you think for first principles back and what's going to happen in the future that, that, that we need to do today is that in the future, there is no rep, there's no manager that doesn't have an AI dedicated to their work, that is not helping them, you know, close deals faster, that is not helping them prioritize their day, that is not helping them um, figure out what accounts to pursue, what accounts not to pursue, who to, who to follow up with, and, and sort of get the aggregate of those reports to a manager and making sure that the team is moving forward and delivering. So in, in that future, if you work it back to today, the things that are important is how do you lay out that data? How do you make you know, your, your, your partner in the enterprise trustworthy, which is what Salesforce did today? How do you make sure that you're accumulating data and processing in such a way that you are increasingly helping the reps workflows and making them more successful? Okay. Now, will that this, this, uh, the, the, this, this displace jobs? I doubt it because people will, you know, organizations will get greedy and they will see that with higher efficiency, they can actually drive higher results. So they will continue to hire reps that use Gen AI as part of their day-to-day -day workflow, and that will continue to drive you know, efficient returns and efficient compounding uh, outcomes for, for organizations. So it's a very exciting time right now. Exciting, as long as you're happy to be augmented, as long as you're ensuring you're upping your skill set to work alongside this AI. Manny, what did you hear that was different out of Salesforce that ultimately isn't 
isn't being said by everyone else who's trying to help you with your CRM, with your interactions with your customers, with marketing, when it comes to AI? I think what we're seeing right now is an even playing field among all the, 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 the systems of record players. So you're seeing Dynamics and, and Microsoft coming out with a set of announcements. You see an Oracle coming out with a set of announcements. You're seeing Salesforce coming out with a set of announcements. Three weeks ago, ServiceNow laid out their roadmap for AI and how's that gonna, what's it going to mean for ITSM and the rest of the year. But Manny, Manny, that's really overwhelming for me. I mean, as the journalist who's speaking to all these companies, getting you on to analyze, it feels as though there's too many announcements. Everyone's suddenly trying to make themselves out to be some AI efficient company. How can you discern which one's doing the right things and when? There is no way to go wrong right now. See, the players are going to win. They set out the AI strategy 10 years ago. So if you read, you know, the Salesforce and full search announcement, they actually have been working on a number of things for a while. And this is just the culmination and the and the and the, another turn of the flywheel of getting their AI on, on the on, onto the market now with the help of generative AI. So generative AI is just another flavor of a bunch of AI that has been built over the past ten years. It's the same thing for outreach. We've been working with workflows and we've been looking at, at what the what is the rep doing or the manager doing, what is the outcome of those workflows, and feeding that into models so that we can make people more productive. Generative AI is just another gear into that into that flywheel. Mm -hmm. So everyone is going to have enhancements to the user experience on their platforms. And that is just good news for everybody. Manny, do the enterprises you work with have the technical expertise and the personnel necessary to understand what's happening and then implement it on their end? That is exactly the right question to ask. So the main the main funnel through which AI is going to have to go through, the main uh, the, 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 the mechanism by which AI gets deployed and gets useful is through the human being, is through the worker, is through the project, and through the workflow. And we need to spend more time thinking about how does that AI impact the rep, impact the, the customer success manager, impact the, 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 the support uh, person or professional and, 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 and managers out there to make sure that we are fitting the, the AI to the benefit of the human being, because only then you're going to get the compounding effect of AI plus human delivers uh, drastic results. So we need to spend more time educating the, the, our team members and the, and the recipients into the, new, into the new workflows, into the new possibilities that AI, AI bring to the table. Without it, you're not going to get adoption. So that, that is the part that we all need to be talking about, is what are you doing to drive adoption of AI at your customer's point, not in the technology delivery. Technology delivery is very easy right now. It's right. customer adoption on our part. All right, our thanks to Outreach CEO Manny Medina, who's reacting, Carrie, to Salesforce setting out what they're doing yeah. in the field of AI in the last 24 hours. Now, coming up, the state of the venture industry and what will be the next big thing enabled by AI. More on that with forerunners Brian O'Malley. That's next. This is Bloomberg. Time for the VC roundup. First up, Insight Partners has cut the target size of its latest fund to $15 billion from the earlier target of $20 billion as it sees, quote, a great reset in tech. That's according to the Financial Times, citing a letter to institutional investors. The firm has so far raised about $2 billion for its 13th fund. Similarly, Technology Crossover Ventures, or TCV, has raised 50 to 75 percent less capital for its flagship fund, down from the planned 5.5 billion target set last year. That's according to the information citing securities filings and a document compiled by one of TCV's limited partners. TCV has raised 1.4 billion for its flagship fund. Finally, wafer producer Cubic PV says it secured over $100 million in new firm equity commitments for its U.S. factory plans and product Romac, SCG, Hunt Energy and Breakthrough Energy, all committed capital with the first $33 million to be released immediately. Caroline. Let's stick with this world of VC. We're very pleased to welcome to the show Brian O'Malley, managing partner at Forerunner Ventures. $2 billion in assets under management. And really, Brian, you state your claim in some of the key companies you've backed before are very consumer-focused. I'm thinking of the Glossiers, him and hers, Aura. At the moment, you seem to be looking at a lot 
uh, the platforms that empower gig economy workers. And I'm interested as to how much your time is currently helping your portfolio companies basically ensure that they're empowered with AI, that they're not having their lunch eaten elsewhere. Yeah, absolutely. I think AI is on everyone's mind these days. It's something that I've been hearing you guys talk about all morning. It's something we're talking about in our offices all day long. And so we did a survey recently of our portfolio to really understand where they're exploring. And it's not surprising that about 80 to 90 percent of the portfolio companies are already leveraging AI in some fashion. And the rest are thinking about it. And it starts with marketing. It starts with the product. And then they're really thinking about internal processes and how they can automate internal processes as well. For your portfolio companies and the founders you invest in, what is the single biggest factor that would push them to invest in AI? Why do they need it? Well, everyone is trying to be both more efficient as well as provide more value to their end customers. And we're finding ways where if they can put their people first and then enable some of the back end processes to be leveraged through AI, that enables them to have more human element, even though they're taking advantage of these new technologies. I think it poses the question, Carrie, going back to consumer, because I was getting ready for this segment and I was kind of looking forward to not talking about AI. And we're two and a half minutes in and we've already ruined that. But Traditionally, for VCs, the consumer se segment is risky. You're against giant global conglomerates who are also innovating. Why do you want to focus there in, in more consumer-facing startups and their platforms? Sure. Well, we, we believe that when you focus at something, you can be the best in the world at it. And that's what we're trying to do in terms of understanding both what consumers want right now. We spend a lot of our time not pontificating, but really listening. So we do a fair amount of focus groups, a fair amount of surveys to understand what is top of mind for people. And even though there's all this innovation, people are still left wanting more. They've got challenges in their personal lives. They're looking for community and connection. And they're also thinking about how they can get better purpose, better self-reliance. And so we feel like as much as there's dollars going into the ecosystem, there's a lot of needs still being unmet for consumers. And we believe the founders we work with can help solve those needs. You know, Caroline, we've, we've had VCs and founders on the show that are, that are making something for the consumer and valuing that offering is really hard. Yeah, I mean, Brian, I'm having a lot of conversations with VCs who've primarily backed consumer-focused companies. And at the moment, they say they're not touching them with a barge pole in terms of new checks to be written. How much is the valuations of the companies that you currently have had just having to right size still at the moment. Sure. Well, there's there's a combination of the portfolio as there always is, and the ratio may change a little bit. But our best companies are still finding dollars available to them. They're still raising capital, and they're able to do what they need to do. The companies that are struggling, they continue to struggle, and a lot of that comes down to just this question around whether they found product market fit mm -hmm. and whether their timing is right for what they're ultimately offering. And so we look at a time where. A lot of other consumer investors are left scratching their head because they found themselves chasing some of these shiny objects. We find that we, when we're grounded, talking to people, talking about what their needs are, and looking at how that is juxtaposed against new business models and new technologies, we find that there's more than enough opportunities to invest in. It's just about finding the right ones where we have the right founder fit based on our ambition and based on what they're trying to do. Talk to us about the founder fit. Of course, there was a lot of concern that as you know, that sucking feeling, sucking noise started to happen in terms of all the money coming out of the situation. It was going to leave particularly diverse founders at sort of most hard hit. But then now what I'm hearing is actually the diverse founders have been used to being scrappy ultimately, and they're actually better at weathering these sorts of downturns because they know how to have a, have a sort of nimble business. Are you seeing that? How much are you able to continue to support founders who perhaps wouldn't have had checks previously? Yeah, absolutely. We're, we're looking for founders today to be scrappier than they've ever been before. But scarcity is an important trait for these startup companies. When you have too many things going on, it enables you to, foc to lose your focus. And when there's less resources, when there's less people on the team, it's easier to pick what's the one priority we need to get accomplished now. And that's what we're working with our teams on to help them pick that priority and then help them make, execute against it. Brian, what's your exit strategy when you're in this space? Our exit strategy is really simple. We try to build great businesses, and those great businesses tend to have lots of opportunities come, come towards them. And that window might be changing a little bit. It might be harder to sell a company. It might be harder to take it public right now. But if you're building a durable, sustainable business where the customers love what you're doing, time is actually your friend versus your enemy. And that's what we're trying to help our companies do. All right, Full Round Adventures Managing Partner, Brian O'Malley, thank you very much.
Federal prosecutors in the Theranos case are asking for Elizabeth Holmes to pay $250 every month in restitution once she's released from prison. But lawyers for the former Theranos CEO say she has, quote, limited financial resources and should not have to make the monthly payments. Holmes has said she can't afford to pay the nine-figure sum demanded by the U.S. over $452 million. Caroline. Yeah, I would keep... Upbeat. Well, keep you abreast of that particular moving story. Meanwhile, another one you must have seen. Former Twitter CEO Jack Dorsey getting called out by India, the nation, about, well, Twitter and its former actions there. More on that next. This is Bloomberg. Twitter's former CEO, Jack Dorsey, says authorities had threatened the platform during the farmer protests unless Twitter removed certain politically sensitive posts. Now, India's Minister of State for Electronics and IT fired back at Dorsey, saying, quote, that's a lie. Bloomberg's technology editor, Sarah Fryer, joins us on set with more. Let's start, I guess, with the with retort. What is it that, that India is saying Twitter is lying or Jack Dorsey specifically is lying about? Well, they're saying that they never shut Twitter down and that nobody went to jail. That's not what Dorsey was saying. He was saying that there were threats that, that, that the company would be shut down and that employees would be threatened. So, I mean, what, what you're seeing here, this is just a microcosm of what's happening with Twitter across the world, which is governments are realizing that they can, they can ask for the company to do certain things, to take down uh, posts from dissidents, from people who are criticizing the government, and say they're in violation of law. And if they don't comply, they could lose their market power in that country. And that is something that I think is going to be even more difficult under um, the new CEO, Linda Yaccarino, and, and new owner of Twitter, Elon Musk. Yeah. We're, we're talking about what Dorsey happened in 2021. Uh, and now Twitter has so many fewer of those global legal policy employees who really understand uh, local governments um, and, and large governments like India and how to navigate those different political stumbling blocks that come about. I mean, I'm thinking of Linda Yaccarino's recent tweet thread, and she really wants to make Twitter the open place for discussion. And ultimately, certain countries are going to find that difficult. We know India, of course, does tend to fight back against social media. I mean, they banned TikTok, for example, one of the only key countries to do that. How, how do you think you can navigate that? So, Cara, I'm going to jump in here because I think Sarah lost, lost you in her ear. But, but basically the question is, what do we know about how Twitter is now handling its global relationships with regulators in different jurisdictions? What we know is that a lot of the executives who were in charge of trust and safety at Twitter, who were in charge of ensuring that the site is, is complying with laws, is taking down hate speech and misinformation and, and violent content, that they are, um, you know, losing a lot of those top executives who were in charge. Um, and I think that that makes it very difficult because you, when you're working with governments and negotiating with governments, they say this is against the law. Twitter used to fight those cases. They used to fight Turkey. They used to fight in Egypt and say, like, no, like, we're going we're gonna to keep those posts up. We're not going to give you information on those people. What's going to be really interesting is to see how, um, how Twitter's changes and fights adjust given that their owner Elon Musk also has other business interests in the countries where Twitter is operating with Tesla with SpaceX with with Starlink it, it could get very complicated mm. all right Bloomberg Sarah Fryer thank you here on SF all things Twitter Caro yeah notable that that town square that Linda Yaccarino talks about currently talking about well a football club close to our home and at the moment when it comes to Manchester right. United but we don't have time to talk about that because it's the end of this edition of Bloomberg Technology it's uh, second day of the week, busy week so far. So don't forget, you can recap with the podcast wherever you get your podcasts, Apple, Spotify, iHeart, and of course, on all of the core Bloomberg platforms from New York and from San Francisco. This is Bloomberg Technology.